Whether you preferred him as Razor Ramon in the WWE or in WCW as one of the founding fathers of the New World Order, Scott Hall forever left his mark on the wrestling industry. Very few superstars were as cool, charismatic, and at the same time as controversial as the bad guy. Scott will always be remembered for his swagger and for the sensational soundtracks that introduced his character to the masses as he strutted to the squared circle. But like most wrestlers early on in their careers, it took multiple gimmicks and traveling to numerous promotions until his hard work finally paid off. This documentary will chronicle Scott's wrestling career and also take a special look at the music that made the man from Wild One to Wolfpack into House. Let's take a look behind the themes of Scott Hall. Scott Hall began his wrestling career in 1984 under the tutelage of wrestling legends like Dusty Rhodes and Barry Windham. But it was his connection to the American dream that got Scott his first bookings in the business through Jim Crockett's National Wrestling Alliance Florida-based territory. Hall was doing his best Dan Severn impersonation here, and Chico was so huge that he really should have gotten over in a hurry. But unfortunately, when the bell rang, the future bad guy was greener than goose poop. So Big Dust team Scott up with another rookie, the future skyscraper and Waylon Mercy, Dan Spivey. And the duo became known as the American Starship. Hall was named Starship Coyote and Spivey was dubbed Starship Eagle. Why you ask? Well, probably because cocaine is a hell of a drug. At first, the American Starship were booked to wrestle so infrequently that Spivey and Hall were given ground crew jobs for the minor league baseball team that Jim Crockett owned. And when they did get to step inside the square circle? Well, let's just say the team didn't exactly take off as they had hoped. Maybe using a Prince song for their entrance theme while wrestling in the South wasn't a good idea, but who knows? Either way, the team only tagged together for a short while before the Starship Coyote hit the road, running towards another territory. Scott Hall's superior size, gloriously curly, hair-sprayed mullet, and powerhouse frame soon caught the eye of legendary wrestling pioneer and owner of the American Wrestling Association, Vern Gagne. By this time, Scott had thankfully dropped that stupid Starship Coyote name and gimmick, and with a look that closely resembled famous Hollywood actor Tom Selleck, he was soon christened Magnum Scott Hall. However, that nickname was short-lived after Vern remembered that Magnum TA was already a thing. So the Creative minds behind the AWA scenes came up with a better alternative. That's right, Big Scott Hall. Now, little did Big Scott know that he was being slowly groomed to be the AWA's top babyface after Vern had botched his relationship with Hulk Hogan, who is now running wild in the WWF, hosting Saturday Night Live and gracing the cover of Sports Illustrated. Gradually working his way up the card, Scott would form a perfect combination together with Kurt Hennig, and the duo won the AWA tag team belt. But despite Vern's desire to push Hall to the top of the card, Scott became tired of the bitterly cold as ice winners in the North Star state of Minnesota. And seeing that the AWA was falling further behind the WWF and NWA, Scott headed south for the warmer temps. Guess Ganya forgot to check if Hall was actually hot-blooded. Over the next few years, Scott would bounce around from promotion to promotion in the United States, Japan, Puerto Rico, and Germany, trying to establish himself as a star, but falling short of a breakout moment. Now, I bet you didn't know that when he wasn't wrestling or grooming his mustache, Scott could sometimes be seen standing marginally close to alligators for sport and thrills. Now, for whatever reason, when Hall returned to Jim Crockett Promotions, he was nicknamed after another animal, this time Gator Scott Hall was his moniker, and he was a J-O-B jobber to the likes of the great Muda, Sid Vicious, and Terry Funk. Despite his overwhelming size, Scott's look and sense of style were basically trapped in the 80s. And while that decade is remembered for its excess obsession of volume, greed is good and bigger is better, hence Scott's AWA nickname, the decade that followed sought to differentiate itself to returning to some kind of realistic normalcy. Running out of options and places to work in the wrestling business, Hall decided he 
needed a makeover, and he made several drastic changes to his appearance. He straightened and slicked back his hair, shaved his signature stash, and replaced it with a permanent 5 o'clock shadow. These tweaks would help Scott get another chance in WCW, where he was repackaged as the Diamond Stud, and paired up with the man who would become responsible for helping him squeeze a few more extra years out of life, DDP Diamond Dallas Page. Unfortunately for Hall and WCW, nobody in the promotion had the foresight to push his stud gimmick very far. However, it was here that the groundwork was laid, even if no one knew it at the time, for the most successful period of his career. I gotta be honest with you, I was not a fan of the first couple of Razor Ramon vignettes that the WWF produced. I mean, I knew who he was, but I just couldn't get past that accent. Chico, chicas, el jefe. It was all just a little too over the top for me. But then I saw Razor wrestle during one of those old school TV taping marathons that would last for like eight hours. Razor's entrance and subsequent walk down the aisle was the coolest that I had ever experienced. Taking a sweet time to get into the ring, flicking his tooth pick at the cameraman and threatening the ringside crew who watched his gold necklaces while he wrestled that if something happens to my gold chains then something happens to you chico it just didn't get any smoother than the bad guy and his wwf theme music man what a stellar jim johnston track the screeching tires the slow confident swagger of the baseline and enough cowbell to keep christopher walken happy for many many years few themes are as iconic as bad boy now johnston must have been listening to a lot of hotel California back then because the rhythm pattern in Razor's theme was lifted almost verbatim from the Eagles track Those Shoes. Close your eyes and listen to this and you'll always see Scott sauntering to the ring draped in gold around his neck, gold around his waist, and oozing massive quantities of machismo, big man. It's easy to overlook just how important Scott Hall was to the paradigm shift that took place in pro wrestling during the 1990s. After finally seizing his moment and becoming a global WWF superstar, Scott was ready to cash in his chips and get paid handsomely. But in the wake of a steroid abuse trial, declining pay-per-view buy rates, and struggling house show numbers, the WWF weren't as liquid as they once were. Plus, Hall's former employer down south was relying on a new negotiation tactic that the WWF was simply unwilling to counter at the time. Guaranteed straight cash homie. You're talking being a salaried employee instead of an independent contractor, working fewer dates and getting paid more money? Well, sign me up, brother. So soon enough, on Memorial Day 1996, Scott shook the wrestling world to its core when he showed up on WCW Monday Nitro, hopped the security railing in a sweet denim cutoff shirt, and uttered the legendary words, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. Here. Hall would have been crazy to pass up an opportunity like this. And speaking of crazy, that reminds me of the Outsiders' first non-NWO theme song. WCW, who is of course no stranger to ripping off theme music, chose this seal sound-alike song to accompany wrestling's baddest heel invaders for their six-man tag team showdown at 1996's Bash at the Beach. <laughs> Hey yo! Despite originating from the public domain as a piece of edgy, outlawish sounding music, Rock House by composer Frank Shelley became one of the most iconic theme songs of all time that became synonymous with not only one of the greatest stables in wrestling history, but also one of the most influential. While it might be considered rather generic in nature, it's an instantly recognizable, repetitive earworm that sampled Jimi Hendrix's wailing guitar. To be honest, after a while, the song can become really obnoxious, kind of like another way too predictable NWO run-in or a rambling 15 to 20 minute Hogan and Bischoff in-ring promo talking about how great they were. But Scott embraced his NWO membership, rocking the house every week and riding this wave of success straight to the bank.
With WCW on top of the wrestling world and thriving because of the New World Order, a peculiar decision was made to split the group into two separate factions, allowing Scott's BFF Kevin Nash to lead a face version of the NWO called the Wolf Pack. Everyone thought the NWO was cool already, but this angle provided the ideal scenario of a good guy group feuding with the NWO Hollywood heels. To differentiate between the two, the Wolf Pack developed a sort of hip hop style and repped red and black colors which gave WCW fans another source of collectible merch. But it was really the Wolfpack's insanely catchy theme produced by the Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart, with a simple beat and an opening howling wolf sound effect that was just too sweet. Now by this time in his career, Scott seemed to be content with getting paid, throwing back a few, and providing for his family. While the rumors of Nash, Hogan, Savage, and others' influence backstage only grew stronger through the years of the Monday Night Wars, Scott distanced himself from the politics in the WCW locker room. Chico held a well-established place on the card and was a proven merch mover. Scott has had one of the most complex careers of any professional wrestler in history. He enjoyed massive success, made a boatload of money, and is a two-time WWE Hall of Famer. Unfortunately, Scott also fought a long, difficult battle with sobriety, which negatively affected his professional career on several different occasions. One of the stages that is least discussed or known about Scott is his time at the original ECW, which basically equates to a one weekend and three matches. Back in early 2000, WCW was in a tailspin. I mean, the ship was really sinking fast, and with Time Warner merging with AOL, the decisions that previously had to do with people linked to wrestling now depended on TV executives. Hall had a bad rap and was known to also have a drug problem, so he was released and spent most of the year chilling at home, until he booked a weekend gig in Poughkeepsie, New York with the Extreme Promotion. Perhaps Hall's lowest lows came during his time on the TNA roster. Having arrived in 2002 after being fired by the WWE over his worsening substance abuse issues, the bad guy who once captivated millions of fans on a weekly basis had been beaten down by years of drug and alcohol abuse. Unfortunately, Hall's condition would only worsen during his time in TNA, where his run is remembered more for his antics outside of the ring than anything he did inside. Hall was notorious for no-showing events, and unlike his time in WWE and WCW, he provided little in the form of creative ideas. In 2010, TNA ownership parted ways with Hall for the final time. Still, this song by Dale Oliver was pretty sweet. Now, I refuse to end this documentary on a downer. Yes, it's true that by 2013, Scott seemed to finally hit rock bottom. Thankfully for Hall, his longtime friend Diamond Dallas Page came to his rescue and helped Scott get in shape, overcome his substance abuse issues, and regain control of his life. So much so that Razor Ramon was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2014, and in 2020, Scott was inducted again, this time as a member of the NWO. Rest in power, Razor, and thanks for the memories. And that's it for this documentary. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I look forward to taking you further behind the themes in future documentaries. Now, if you have any suggestions or recommendations for us, please leave a comment down below, and don't forget to give this video a massive thumbs up. Go ahead and also share it with a friend who you think might also like it, because it really helps our channel grow and reach new people. Also, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing for weekly wrestling theme song content, and don't forget to follow us on social media so you get all our latest updates, and we'll see you next time. Wrestling behind the themes.